hosting tonight's uh, discussion on 10 years later, how 9-11 influenced a generation and U.S. foreign policy. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, this is part of a, a series of Young Professionals events that we hold uh, monthly here in D.C. And so if this is the first one you're at, um, feel free to reach out to any of our staff uh, and we can make sure you get on the list for future events. Um, the Foreign Policy Initiative was set up in 2009 uh, to promote U.S. international engagement, and uh, our mission is uh, all about promoting a center-right internationalist uh, foreign policy, support for free trade, promotion of democracy and human rights, um, winning the wars we're engaged in in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, among other issues. Um, this is a very important issue for us because a lot of the way that we at the Foreign Policy Initiative view the world, I think, has in part been shaped by 9-11, certainly um, for many of the uh, uh, of our staff who uh, are in their 20s and 30s. Um, when FPI was launched originally in 2009 and promoting this internationalist vision, I think um, many of us thought that perhaps we had won the argument, there was no need, we could close uh, our doors after six months. But given recent political developments, uh, mainly after the midterm elections, I think we've seen a bit of a shift in the debate here in Washington. And so I think we certainly have our work cut out for us on a variety of issues, we've seen that play out on Capitol Hill, on uh, topics like uh, defense spending, on the intervention in Libya, on questions about what the U.S. should do uh, given the ongoing uh, killings of protesters in Syria. And we've also seen um, some Republicans and some people on the right start to waver uh, about the question of whether and how long we should stay in Afghanistan. Um, I personally got involved in, in a lot of these debates uh, because of 9-11. I was in grad school on 9-11 on here at Georgetown. It uh, helped shape my decision to go into government service, and I, I served at the Pentagon and the White House in the Bush administration. And one thing we want to address tonight and uh, have our panelists get into is uh, what are the lasting uh, effects and impacts of 9-11. Of um, is there a 9-11 generation and, and questions along those lines, along with a uh, back and forth, I think, uh, hopefully between the two of them and, and with all of you about what the post 9-11 U.S. Uh, foreign policy legacy is uh, 10 years on. And uh, I think this, these will be interesting topics. Um, to address them, we have uh, two great panelists. We have Abe Greenwald, uh, who's a senior editor at Commentary in New York. Uh, he's written a number of publications. He also, full disclosure, I'm not biased between the two panelists, but he also worked uh, for me at, at uh, FPI. Uh, early in our, our time as an organization. Um, to his right, we have Ross Douthat, who's uh, an op-ed columnist at the New York Times and previously was a senior editor at The Atlantic and uh, a blogger for TheAtlantic.com. Uh, and both of them have written uh, a bit about uh, kind of the, the issue of 10 years after 9-11, um, what the, the legacy and impact is on U.S. foreign policy. And so I think we handed out some of their articles. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Abe to get started since uh, he wrote a very long essay in commentary, which I highly recommend to you despite the time it takes to read it, uh, about the impact of 9-11 uh, on U.S. foreign policy and uh, what we've achieved uh, in the 10 years uh, hence. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Jamie. Can, can everyone hear me? Am I close enough to the mic? Um, the name of my uh, article on 9-11, which is in the September issue of commentary, is What We Got Right in the War on Terror. So I think probably it would be a decent place to start out by reviewing some of that very briefly uh, and also discussing what we got wrong and then um, I guess getting to the question of whether or not there is a 9-11 generation and what that means. What we got right in the War on Terror I think can be divided in some sense in, in two different categories. First there's the sort of intellectual accomplishments and then there are the actual uh, kinetic policies that, that were put in place as a result of those. Uh, intellectually, early on the Bush administration deduced rightly that we were attacked by a fascist theocratic strain of Islam. And while immediately some people on the left and in, in other quarters said we were attacked because of our policies, that is factually true, but it means it's not very satisfying unless one acknowledges that Al-Qaeda's problems with US policy are outgrowths of this fascistic theocratic strain of Islam. 
this was not a reading of the events that necessarily had to happen. It, it, it was certainly today one wonders if the, if the present administration would, would read such an attack in the same way. I, I can't say they wouldn't, but there's certainly some reason to think that their response might be something more along the lines of American complicity with previous distasteful actions and policy. Excuse me one second. The second intellectual accomplishment early on, I think, was in judging correctly that Osama bin Laden did not, in fact, hope to draw the U.S. into the Middle East, into the greater Middle East, in um, some sort of overbearing, guns blazing, American overreach that would then bring sympathy to his cause. This was a popular reading back then on, on both sides of the aisle. There, there, were, there were people who thought, who gave Osama bin Laden a little too much strategic credit, who believed that he had this grand plan to bring the U.S. into this, into an overwhelming uh, uh, action of this sort, and, and this would thereby bring sympathy to his cause and create a wedge between the U.S. and the non-Islamic uh, uh, dictatorial governments against whom al-Qaeda was fighting. In fact, if you look at bin Laden's own writings and quotes on the matter, he had laughed off the idea of a, of a strong American response to any terrorist attack. He famously called us a paper tiger. He cited the Black Hawk Down uh, incident, the the various uh, 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 cruise missile, ineffective cruise missile responses to individual acts of terrorism, and so on. He in no way expected what he got immediately, which brings us to the actual policies and the kinetic action. The war in Afghanistan immediately deposed the Taliban, set up the internationally recognized government of Hamid Karzai, killed and captured thousands of, of militants, um, broke down the, the, hierar the, the hierarchy, the, the, the intense bureaucratic framework of Al-Qaeda at the time. They had labs, they had banks, they had, they had dormitory facilities, they had training camps, they, you, you name it, they had it. All that and the, and the, and the structure that was vital to them being able to plan the kind of attack they did was, was, was broken up in that first, first attack in Afghanistan. Of course, what we failed to do the first time around was capture bin Laden, which is no small failure, and of course we failed to nation build, which set the stage for the Taliban to make nearly a complete comeback, first noticed or first sort of discussed in, alarm, in, in, in alarming tones some five years later. Um, I would argue that Something else we got right is the war in Iraq, is the centrality of Iraq to the war on terror. I will be arguing this apparently for the rest of my days. Well, it's, 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 it's an argument I'm happy to have. Um, people often say that Iraq had nothing to do with al-Qaeda, with terrorism. In fact, bin Laden's 1998 declaration of war on the U.S. cites three crimes uh, that the West is supposedly committed, for which we will pay dearly. The first two have to do with Iraq, and even the third alludes to it as well. They, 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 they have to do with the U.S. stationing troops in Saudi Arabia and using those troops to, to, fight, to, to fight Saddam, to get Saddam out of, out of Kuwait in the first Gulf War. The third charge is about Israel, and even that, despite uh, uh, popular sentiment, even that, uh, bin Laden is sure to note, um, is really, he, he says that, he says that our, our Iraq policy and our, and our Saudi policy is really just a distraction from, from what we're doing in, in Israel. So, so, so Iraq is tied into all three. And I would add that there's a, a larger reason why Iraq was, we always had this date with Iraq, which is that if you think back on the darkest days of the Iraq war, there became popular this, this idea that George Bush the Elder, when he went into the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, uh, 
knew enough, was wise enough, was prudent enough, was quote unquote realist enough not to overstep his mandate and not to go into Iraq and depose Saddam, but, but merely to push Saddam out of Kuwait as he was expected to do and, and to do nothing else. He was not actually realist or prudent enough to avoid al-Qaeda's tripwire because in fact, those very realist policies are the, are the same ones that, that caused Osama bin Laden to declare war on the US. Keeping Saddam in his supposed box required us to be in Saudi Arabia and to bomb Saddam periodically in various, various smaller strikes and excursions and so on. Um, this is not to say Osama bin Laden had a point, it's merely to say that there was never any realist shortcut around our showdown with jihad and with al-Qaeda. They, they, this, this is a war we could not have avoided by being ever more prudent and ever more uh, respectful of, of, of others and other cultures and, and ever more um, restrained in, in the use of American power. I'll jump around because we don't have all that much time. Something else we got right is the war at home. That is to say the no-fly lists, the, and, and these are all policies that everyone hates, but yet we have not been attacked in 10 years. Um, no one wants to be patted down. No one likes the, 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 um, the, the extrajudicial wiretapping. No one likes uh, Guantanamo Bay. No one likes the detentions. No one likes enhanced interrogation. Yet, we have, they, they have been proven to work. And these should be discussed, by the way. This is the, we, we, are, we, are a, we are a free country that prides itself on individual liberty. And these are things that should be debated vigorously. Um, but they have, by and large, worked. Even when you think it's a matter of luck, I would argue they worked. When Abdullah Matab, the, the supposed so-called underwear bomber, uh, failed to ignite his, his explosive underwear, uh, uh, people say, well, how lucky we got. We, we, we're doing so poorly that if, if, if he had just done that right, we would, we, would, we would have had another attack. True. But it's not a sheer matter of luck. He was, using, he was using a plastic explosive that I would argue he was forced into using, just as the Times Square bomber was using too weak uh, of, a, of a fertilizer to explode. Because of the laws and because of the way we have cracked down on, on things like buying fertilizer and buying, and buying uh, 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 hair bleach and not letting people bring liquids on the plane. If he brought a liquid on the, if, if, if we didn't do that, as much as it upsets people, uh, he probably would have had a lot better chance of, of, of exploding that plane with, 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 with some sort of uh, liquid explosive. Um, I'd say what we, and, and of course, uh, I can't, I can't, I, I almost forgot what I think is probably the most important intellectual uh, decision. I'm gonna go jump back in, in all of this, which is the freedom agenda, which is that George W. Bush, determined, rightly, that the political hothouses of the Middle East are creating and have been creating jihad as the only alternative for political redress in, in miserably failed societies and offered the hope of democracy and representative government consciously as a choice, as an alternative to this, not absolutely, Statecraft doesn't allow us to simply dump every strategic and economic obligation in favor of every ideal. A lot of us would like to see it, it doesn't work that way. But he changed the balance. Um, and I think that was critical. And I remain convinced that what we're seeing now in the Arab Spring would not have happened, or not have happened as soon as it did without what went on, without our toppling Saddam when we did, the first fully functioning election didn't take place in Iraq until 2009. It was only later in 2009 that Iran's June 12th uh, widely believed rigged election spurred democratic, democratic protests across the country. Uh, if, we look, if, we, if we remember what happened in Lebanon, lead, democratic leaders there were open were ab ab about America's toppling Saddam being, being an influence on their democratic thought there. And I, I would draw a straight line straight on through to Tunisia and Egypt and, 
and Libya. Um, now, it's very easy to say, well, wow, boy, did we open a can of worms. What a terrible policy. Um, I'll be saying I, that. I, Yes, in, yes, of course. Of course, I, I expect that much. Uh, I would say this is a misreading. I, I, would, I would say, the, I, I would say it, the, the, to the extent to which it looks bad, and, and I'm not unsympathetic to, to those who think it looks bad, uh, that, that is a function of our not being involved, of our not sticking to the freedom of agenda, of, and, and of Bush's having stepped back from the freedom agenda uh, when he did. Because if this was going to happen, how much better would we have been placed? How much, better, how much more influence could the U.S. have had when this all happened if we had been more firmly on the side of the Democrats there? And how much more influence could we have now if we are on the side of the Democrats there? Um, seeking them out, helping them, making aid to these countries conditional on reform um, and, and using uh, our, our complete covert arsenal to undo the bad guys as well. Um, about a 9-11 generation, I, I, I think there's probably, to my mind, about three 9-11 generations. There are those who went and fought for the US after 9-11 knowing that they were gonna get into war. Um, they have my lifelong admiration, and they should have all of yours, and they are, we, we owe them everything these past 10 years. When I think of 9-11 generation, though, somehow my mind goes to the Vietnam generation. It, to me, it's a sort of a similar kind of, kind of formulation. And I think of a generation of, of Americans whose, pol whose political impulses are shaped in opposition to what the American government does. And I think there's no question that we have that now. I think no one likes these wars. Uh, the vote for Obama in general was it was a was 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 a was in some sense a sort of show of disgust with with what 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 we've gotten into these past ten years. Um, Paul Krugman, of course, being being the most vocal uh, on this tenth anniversary uh, anniversary of nine eleven, discussed this nine uh, eleven the, the day forever, sort of marking us with shame because fake heroes hijacked and hijacked the moment to 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 execute poor policies and the rest of it. I'll say two things about that. The first is that um, I don't think American policy, um, Americans are, civilians are never really eager for war. We're not a war hungry people. We haven't become the world leaders or the so-called world police, it's not a term I necessarily object to, because Americans are, are wake up uh, wanting to rule the world or go to war. This has happened because we've had the right leaders at the right time who understand the necessity of doing these things that are unpopular and that are difficult. Um, and that could happen again, and it will happen again. And it has to some degree already happened again under Obama. Uh, so in some sense, it doesn't, I'm not, I don't, it's disheartening to see this 9-11 generation who's defined itself in, in, in objection to American policy, but in some sense, I don't think it's, it, it's in the long run, in the grand sweep of history, it's going to matter all that much. Um, one only needs to look at the sort of rehabilitated image of George W. Bush. He, uh, you know, 9-11, he got standing ovations in New York, of all places. Barack Obama did not. That's not true. He got a standing ovation. Uh, Bush got a standing ovation in Shanksville. He got applause in New York, and Barack Obama did not. Um, and the other thing I'll say about it is that for as much disgust and, and weariness as Americans feel over war on terror policy, nothing will change their minds like a good three or four years of non-war on terror policy. Uh, if we lose the, the war in Iraq, which I would argue we're, we're terribly close to doing, if we lose the, the war in, by the way, losing the war in Iraq all over again after having won it, by, by leaving 3,000 troops there, which is Obama's decision. If we lose the war in Afghanistan, which I would argue we're terribly close to doing. If we blow the opportunity of the Arab Spring, which, which we're, we've almost done. Um, and if we let Iran go nuclear, and if we let China and Russia cut all these deals with, with these countries, nothing will make American involvement in the rest of the world's affairs look as appealing. So, I think in some weird way, it's sort of good that Americans have become sort of as fickle as they have, you know, voting for Obama and then, and then the, 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 the midterm elections is a total refutation and we, who knows what, what's gonna happen 
2012, but the point is they, they are fickle. And I don't think there's anything necessarily lasting about the, the overwhelming distaste to the war on terror. Um, if I've left anything out, we can address it later. I hope it didn't go on too long, but that's, 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 that's my spiel. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, for having me, and thank you so much, Abe, for putting up with me again. We did an event like this um, in New York, and as I was trying to find my notes from that event, they were in the pocket of this jacket, which makes me realize that I'm wearing the exact same outfit that I wore then, <laughs> which may tell you something about my current way of life. Um, we have, a, we have a baby at home, so this is my, my excuse, and maybe you're lucky that I'm dressed at all. Um, <laughs> they are recording this shoot. Um, so um, what Abe has written, and I'll join Jamie in commending to you his um, essay and commentary this month, uh, because I think it does a masterful job of synthesizing um, well, what exactly what you heard him talk about, this sort of range of disparate elements that have gone into America's post-9-11 foreign policy from sort of the intellectual side of defining the enemy, defining our strategy and so on, to the sort of kinetic tactical side, to, um, you know, the big questions like, you know, were we right to go into Afghanistan as we did? Were we right to invade Iraq? How does this relate to Osama bin Laden and so on? Um, I am going to attempt to slightly disentangle uh, that masterful synthesis in the interest of making a case half in support of Abe and uh, uh, half in dissent. Um, and the disentanglement I'm going to attempt, and uh, I think he's absolutely right that it's not completely possible to disentangle all these elements, but, but I think it is worth stepping back and looking at America's response to 9-11, our policy response from a sort of twofold perspective. Um, and disentangling what you might call the literal war on terrorists, which we've been engaged in um, pretty much steadily for, for the past 10 years and which has continued um, in certain ways in, in an accelerated fashion under the Obama administration. Um, disentangling that from the broader shift in our grand strategy uh, post 9-11, which I think Abe rightly defines as some combination of the sort of the broad freedom agenda, um, you know, the, the idea that American security ultimately depends on liberty in the Muslim world, uh, and then the particular focus on um, sort of Iraq and sort of Mesopotamia writ large as the place where that transformation could best be affected and begun. So on the question of the literal war on terrorists, the campaign to disrupt terrorist organizations, destroy their ability to wage war against us, um, capture or perhaps better still kill their leaders. Um, I think that, that Abe and I are in, are in agreement with you know all sorts of obvious caveats and blind alleys and all the rest. This has been a remarkable success. Um, and I think this success is manifest everywhere from you know sort of the high profile cases like the death of Osama bin Laden earlier this year, the capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and so on, to the broader sort of constant disruption of Al-Qaeda's network, its ability to wage war against us, and so on. And in, in the media, there's a tendency to sort of roll our eyes when the US government announces that once again, we've killed Al-Qaeda's number three, you know, or number four. And, you know, there's obviously some of that is justified, and, you know, the government likes to, you know, maybe that guy was actually number seven, and we said he was a number three, and so on. But there is a sense in which that constant drumbeat reflects the fact that we have made it incredibly difficult over the past 10 years to do business as a serious anti-American terrorist around the world. Um, and that is, has been manifested, I think, in the remarkable run, uh, in the remarkable absence of sustained serious um, terror attacks on the homeland. There have been a few serious sort of attempted plots, and then there have been cases sort of of lone wolves, the sort of the Nadal Hassan case. You could argue that the Virginia sniper may have been influenced by some jihadist ideology and so on. But I would argue that even the cases that have, A, come close, like the, the panty bomber, I guess you could say, in Detroit, or the cases that have sort of succeeded in some, in some sense, like, like Nadal Hassan's shooting spree, are themselves testaments to are at least partial victory over terror networks because they reflect, you know, there's no way that the United States, a nation of 300 million with porous borders, no matter what we do and so on, is ever gonna be completely safe from terror attacks. But it's revealing the kind of terror attacks 
one, that are almost succeeding, and two, that are happening. They are lone wolves. They're sort of plots, I think, as Abe said, with insufficient fertilizer to make the bomb work and so on. They're nothing like the kind of attack that happened on 9-11, which, yes, in certain ways involved luck and chance and so on, and, and, and it was in, in certain ways maybe less, a less impressive operation than it seemed in that frozen moment on the morning of 9-11, but it was still a very impressive operation and reflected a, you know, a huge degree of planning and terrorist infrastructure and so on that, as far as we can tell, you know, knock on whatever this is, um, doesn't, doesn't exist today. And I, I mean, I think you can see this in the plot that they talked about related to the 10th anniversary of 9-11. You know, three guys coming into the country trying to set off a car bomb. Well, you know, I mean, three guys are always going to be able to come into the United States of America, and if they really, really want to and are, you know, moderately intelligent, going to be able to set off some sort of car bomb somewhere in the country. Even if that kind of plot succeeded, it still wouldn't represent the kind of blow that we suffered 10 years ago, and it still wouldn't be a sign that our counterterrorism strategy is failing. I think our strategy overall is, is succeeding. I think on the question of the grander strategy, the sort of geopolitical vision of how the war on terror, terrorists fits into America's broader attitude towards its position in the world, um, the Middle East, and so on, I think Abe's case gets a little more strained and a little less persuasive, and here I fall into the camp of what, you know, what Jamie would call maybe the weak need waverers and so on. But, but I, I, I think that if you, you know, ultimately you have to assess a grand strategy on its results. And if I, you look at the United States position, not only in the Arab and Muslim worlds, but um, sort of more broadly vis-a-vis -vis rising powers like China, um, and to a lesser extent Brazil and India, sort of perpetual problem nations like our friends the Russians and so on, on almost every front and in almost every way, the United States is in a weaker position than it was 10 years ago. Um, and this is, I think, you know, there are a lot of reasons for this, many of which have nothing to do with the choices that U.S. policymakers have made and the rise of China was going to happen no matter what. And, I mean, it's a good thing that, you know, China, it, it would be a worse thing for the world if China were growing poorer rather than richer and so on. So, uh, but with all of that being said, Overall, if you look at the fruits of our 10 years of, of intervention, military intervention in the Middle East, um, sort of the rhetoric of democracy promotion and sometimes the reality of it and so on, I think defenders of the grand strategy are still stuck making arguments about the long term. And those arguments may be vindicated, and I hope that they are, but at a certain point it be, you have to sort of stop and take stock and say, well, you know, how is this strategy working out? Has, you know, is a post-Saddam Iraq that is sort of half in Iran's sphere of influence and is, you know, supportive of Syria's dictator in different ways and so on and so forth, is that, was that worth the American casualties and the blood and treasure that we spend and so on? Is, you know, is Israel's current strategic position in the Middle East, does that reflect a successful U.S. grand strategy over the last 10 years? Or does the fact that Israel is more ringed with enemies than ever suggest that maybe overall, you know, there was a little bit more to be said for the sort of, um, some of the sort of quote unquote realist stability-oriented stability, stability -oriented policies of the past. Um, so that's, that's sort of my broad, uh, my broad view. And I think that, um, you know, I think that there are strong arguments in favor of the long-term view that, you know, ultimately sort of American security, the world security over a sort of 100-year span will benefit from some sort of democratization in, in, in the Middle East. And Abe has made versions of this argument. I think rural Mark Garex uh, has made some of the, you know, some of the strongest ca cases for this. But I think from the point of view of American policymakers, making bets on those kind of time horizons, even if they potentially work out is not how great powers should proceed. I think great powers have more of a short-term obligation, um, more of a sort of a focus on short-term security is more appropriate than long-term gambles. And I think that the decision to be, for us, given our overall position to become a revisionist power, you might say, when we were, in the moment we decided to become a revisionist power, the strongest power in the existing order, 
was fundamentally a mistake. Um, so that's my overall view. And I, I would say um, to, to, to the question about the 9-11 generation, which we can get into a little bit more, I would, I would just say to, to Abe's point, which I think is, is correct, right, that it inevitably the sort of 9-11 generation phenomenon that He's, that, that he was describing at the end, the sort of war weariness and so on, and the, the sense that, you know, Americans, if you can't see the consequences, even, you know, even if the policy is good, if Americans aren't seeing the immediate consequences, they'll gradually get tired and turn against it and so on. I think that it reflects what might be the deepest problem with the sort of grand strategic turn we took after 9-11, which is the extent to which in order to work the, the, the sort of freedom agenda, the sort of democracy promotion, the idea that we, you know, needed to nation build substantially, not only in Iraq, but in Afghanistan over an extended time horizon, it required a different political reality than the one in which we live. And I think, again, any grand strategy has to deal with the fact that even if it's the right thing to do to have 100,000 troops in Afghanistan for 25 years, if you aren't going to be able to keep the American people on board over that span, then that can't be your strategy. Even if it's intellectually correct, you have to reckon with the political realities at home when you're devising. And I think the same is true with the invasion of Iraq. I think it's clear, in hindsight, especially given the successes of the surge, that the decision to go into Iraq with so few troops was you know, a, fundamental, a fundamental error that had it been rectified, um, I, you know, I think the war in Iraq, public opinion on the war in Iraq would look very different. But I question whether public opinion would have supported the war in Iraq in the first place if we had invaded that country with the kind of troop commitment necessary to stabilize it from the get-go. And I think there were reasons, political reasons, why the Bush administration made the mistaken attempt to minimize um, the costs of going in from the beginning. And I think that political reality ultimately, you know, un undergirds my skepticism about um, the grand strategy we chose and the one that Abe is defending. So. I will, I will leave it there, and thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks to both uh, Abe and Ross for those introductory comments. I guess I'll pose one question um, to both of you, kind of tying together the two original questions I threw out there, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, I think, I mean, you both obviously addressed uh, the impact of 9-11 on U.S. foreign policy over the last 10 years, and then the 9-11 generation question. I mean, I think the one, one thing that's interesting to me is this uh, very provocative suggestion that I think Abe makes in his article about the centrality of Iraq, uh, and in terms of arguing that this contributed to our success in the war on terror thus far. Um, but my sense is that probably, uh, as I think uh, Ross started to get into, that is directly relevant to the debate about is there a 9-11 generation, or if there was, what happened to them over the last 10 years. Uh, or what happened to kind of public opinion in the country generally over the last 10 years. Um, Ross wrote a, a column in the New York Times, I think in June, uh, comparing kind of the, the uh, I think it was Rand versus Rubio, or Rubio, uh, Rand and Rubio. And I just was reading Marco Rubio's first major foreign policy speech, which he gave at 5 p.m. tonight um, before I came over here. And uh, it's striking the different worldviews that we still have being presented, even amongst people who um, both are, I think, identify with, with the Tea Party. But Ross very, I think, compellingly ended his, his column talking about uh, the, the Rubio vision and saying that this is a story that many conservatives and many Americans want to believe. Once I believed it myself, but that was many years ago and many wars ago, and now I think Rand Paul is right. Um, I'm, I, I don't sort think of a you're, rhetorical yeah. flourish. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think it was I, it was very apt though because I think uh, I know a lot of people who have that view, and so I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, maybe there was a significant 9/11 generation and impact that uh, on the country's um, uh, psyche that we perhaps would have thought would have lasted longer. Because the thing that's been striking to me, ten years on, now as an old man of, of 34 talking to people who are in their 20s and who were much younger when 9-11 occurred is, is the lack of, of uh, influence the, the event itself and perhaps the immediate aftermath seems to have had on their strategic worldview. And I think a lot of that has to do with perhaps um, the implementation of the policy that Abe laid out. And so I'd be interested in fleshing out, uh, hear your, hearing you flesh out your thoughts on how much of it is it really was the wrong strategy, 
or how much of it goes back to the implementation of that strategy and the, the things that, uh, some of the things that you referenced, Ross, the under-resourcing of the war in Iraq, you could say the same thing about Afghanistan, the fact that we're still in Afghanistan and the troop numbers that we are is in part because of some missteps that we made in the early years after uh, the invasion. So maybe I'll ask Abe to start um, and uh, Ross then to respond as well. Sure. I mean, on the, you know, in terms of Iraq, the interesting thing is that it, it didn't start out as an unpopular war at all. It, it, it had, certainly had bipartisan support, it, and it had, it had the support of the general public, and it had the support of the public a few months in. It's only when the story got bad that it became unpopular. Um, I would argue that, and this, this would apply to uh, both the question of American, of, of, of the 9-11 generation, and to, to and, and in response to Ross's point about, good point about, about America standing in the, in the world since these policies have been implemented. Um, nothing would have kept American popular opinion on board and sustained American power in the world, America's role in the world, quite like victory. Um, it's, 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 it's in giving up on these policies prematurely. It's, it's in being a penny wise and a pound foolish, which we are now certainly doing in things like, like leaving 3,000 troops behind in Iraq so they can't even function credibly and productively, uh, but they can continue to serve as targets for terrorists and jihadists over there without the resources to defend themselves. Um, the, the, poli the policies of extrication, um, I think, have done us a lot more harm than our ambitions at first. And in, term, in terms of the implementation of the war in Iraq, I, I, to my mind, it's less a question of, how, of the initial commitment of the number of troops than it is the bad policies, the, the, the debathification policies, which, which put, by some counts, a half a million uh, unemployed Iraqi soldiers and connected Baathists, uh, Sunni, Sunni, Iraqi Sunnis out on the street, uh, knowing that, that it was American policy that did it and that, and that, the, and that the Shia were about to about to rise up. There's no question, I mean, we made huge mistakes in Iraq. I didn't sort of address that, I guess, um, in, my first, in my first intro, but, but, but we made huge mistakes in Iraq. Um, but don't forget, the majority of the country was behind this policy as a policy. They didn't object on ideological grounds, in terms of values, in terms of commitment. They were behind it. They only turned on it when it stopped looking like we were gonna win. Um, so I think changing the facts on the ground changes public opinion, both here and, and abroad. That, that's my quick answer to it. But I mean, don't, don't you think that, you know, the, the, the words you didn't utter just now were WMD, right? And, and I mean, to the extent that the American public was, I think you're right, intensely on board, um, Democratic and Republican parties both in certain ways, um, had to do with the kind of case that was that was made that, you know, somebody, I want to say, well, somebody else had a different line, but pa Paul Wolfowitz said, right, that WMD, you know, there were lots of reasons to go to war in Iraq, but WMD was the reason that everybody could agree on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's sort of, that's, that's true, that there were lots of arguments for the invasion of Iraq, but I think what Wolfowitz's comment reflects is the fact that WMD was the argument that could sell it to the American public ultimately, mm -hmm. and that had you sold the war in the sort of grand strategic terms that I think a lot of, some people believed, some people adopted maybe after the, after the, the facts, the facts on the ground changed, but I think you I think you argue in your piece, rightly, I think that certainly Bush himself from, from the top, there was always a focus on democracy and transformation, right? It wasn't, for, it was clear that I think administration policy wasn't just focused on the WMD, but in terms of the way the war was sold to the American public and the way it was argued for at the UN and so on down the line, the issue of Saddam's weapons, the threat they posed, the possibility of them ending up in terrorist hands, the possibility of there being a nuclear weapons program and so on, all of that was, was crucial. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, this is, we will be having this argument, right, for 25, 50, 75 years and so on, because it's, there's no question that 
um, you know, I had I had friends working in DOD at that time, um, and there's n the whole you know Bush lied, people died. I mean, there is no question that the people responsible for American policy believed that not only that there were WMD, but that things were worse than anybody thought. And there's no question that this assessment was shared by intelligence agencies and so on, all of which makes that case totally understandable, and it makes the decision to go to war understandable. But by the same token, I think one has to be able to say that if you make a case for war that is perhaps the only case that could sustain the public commitment required to see the war through to a successful conclusion, and then that case turns out to be false, you know, you don't have to believe that the war was a mistake, but the argument that the war was a mistake becomes pretty strong, I think. And that's, that's part of what I, you know, what I come back to with Iraq, that it, 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 there is, yeah, there is a sense in which you know, if the public had sort of stayed with the war, um, you know, and if a lot of decisions had been made differently, we would have had a better outcome and all the rest. But the initial premise behind the invasion turned out to be false, and that had inevitable cascading effects. And in certain ways, it's kind of amazing that, you know, whatever, whatever is about to happen in Iraq now, it's kind of amazing, and yet in many ways a testament to, to President Bush's fortitude and so on that, I mean, if you had told someone, if you had told me when we were invading Iraq, oh, by the way, they're not going to find any weapons of mass destruction, I, I would have been, I was like, well, this is, you know, this, this is like the collapse of the Bush administration, it's, you know, it's the collapse of American credibility and so on. And in certain ways, we weathered that reasonably well, but it's still, still a big deal. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't deny. I, every, I think virtually everything you say is, is correct. I mean, you know, there's, there's sort of, you know, the bad intelligence is, is, is the bad intelligence, and it's, it's inexcusable. You know, it was never, there, there can, you know, the, the weird thing about Iraq was that there were so many good reasons to go in there from, from, the, from the violations of international law to the, you know, the, you know the, 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 having committed genocide, having been in violation of, of, of UN resolutions, having supported international terrorism, all, all of these are facts, to the, the widely internationally held belief that he had WMD, that, that to, to state any one or two reasons in any one sitting, you know, it almost looks like you're, like you're, you're being trickier than you are. So there were many reasons to go in, and many different people had reasons to go in. Um, did the in in you know I'm not in government. Did did the administration in selling, selling the war primarily on the on the WMD uh, case? Did they make a mistake? Clearly, I mean you know only. But do you think they could have sold it without that? Case? I guess that's what I what I come back like it's the a great other. Question. I think the other arguments are, you know, they're they're more intellectual than visceral. I mean, obviously the argument from genocide is a visceral argument for the Iraqi people, but for, right. for Americans? I, I just, I guess I'm, I'm right. skeptical of the counterfactual where Paul Wolfowitz's argument is the argument that's made in public, and then the public doesn't just support the war, but sort of sus supports the, a sustained war effort. Right. My, my suspicion is at that time, during that snapshot in, in modern American history, yeah, I think, I think the war would have been supported without that, without the WMD argument for how long? Not as long as with it, and as and and if there turned out to be WMD there, but I think you know. Don't forget when when in late you know in two thousand two and people you know it's now often discussed very breezily. Uh, it's understood that the U.S. had dropped the ball in Afghanistan and moved on to to Iraq, and I think in some re sense that is very true. But it was widely understood at the time that that America had just experienced an extraordinary defeat, a uh, uh, victory rather, in Afghanistan, and that you know we weren't dropping the ball at all. We we were we were heading to the to the second necessary battle in this war, um, and that was and we believed we could do it. We did. We we had we had accomplished what we had accomplished in our, in, in Afghanistan with the so-called lighter footprint, um, and so yeah, it, you know we we could have built an, enough of a case. I think on on Saddam's sort of you know rolling global crime wave history, uh, and 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 the threat of his ties, which were real, to terrorist organizations in post 9/11 world, um, and and his and his and his record of uh, as a career human rights abuser, um, I think 
I think I think the the argument for war would have held water regardless yeah I think I mean I I sometimes I agree with you but I think that it would have depended on how quickly I think in a weird way there was a window when the Bush administration could have announced any policy and the public would have I mean not any you know what I mean the, the, there was a window when Bush could have come out and said we have a new grand strategy we're going to lance the boil, you know. We're gonna, you know, we're going into Afghanistan, and then in, and then we're gonna go into our Iraq. And you know, it's not just about WMD; it's about a lot of other things. And by the way, six other dictators are on notice. Right. Um, and if that had happened, in a weird, if that had happened fast enough, I think, I think right. maybe you were right. You'd be right. I j I'm skeptical that you know that it would have happened fast enough. And God knows what Paul Krugman would have said. So. <laughs> I want to open it up uh, to the audience for a second. I just want to add one personal anecdote about this. I mean, I think Ross is absolutely correct. I, there was there was this moment for several years after 9-11 where I think the Bush administration had more of free reign, perhaps. I uh, remember vividly being in Ohio in, in 2004 for the presidential election and working on the president's re-election. And for the average voters there at the time, and if you look at the way the Bush campaign um, ran that election, if you look at the president's convention video about his legacy, it was all 9-11 related. And for them, and I know from the, the voters that I interacted with, Iraq for them was tied directly to 9-11. And this is the sort of thing that drove uh, Europeans, uh, European opponents of the war crazy. It drove uh, liberals who were opponents of the war crazy. But the fact of the matter is many, of I think, Americans saw a direct tie between Saddam Hussein in 9-11, even though it obviously didn't exist. And so I think there was that period, maybe before there was some finality about um, the fact that there were no WMDs uh, found in Iraq. Um, but I, I do think that perhaps that, that kind of uh, visceral reaction that, that you guys referred to lasted for uh, a bit of a longer period. And it should be noted that even by the end of 2004, things were starting to go south in Iraq, too. Um, but the mood in the country, I think, was still directly tied back to the events of September 11, 2001. So I'll open it up now. If you could, um, if you could just uh, state your name and affiliation and keep your question brief so we can get to a number of people, that would be great. Uh, my question is, as someone that entered high school um, after 9-11, and as someone, I, Abe, I feel like your essay did a really good job of vindicating our efforts uh, since 9-11, I think that um, there's been a lot of blood and treasure spilled, obviously, and I, th I thought it was a really good vindication of the Bush administration. I feel like nowadays it's kind of heresy to say that, uh, to defend the Iraq war or anything like that. Ross, your speech, I thought your speech did a really good job of uh, explaining the kind of concurrent thought that our generation has been growing up with. That's been that, um, basically, alongside 9-11, there's also been like the rise of China, there's been other threats. You have people like George Friedman at Stratfor saying that jihadism and terrorism is actually coming to an end and that new threats are facing, say, like in the South China Sea. Robert Kaplan also released a book saying the same thing. I guess the bigger question here then to both of you would be how far, I mean, how would you say that the war on terror and jihadism and terrorism are they a part of our long-term strategy? Is that a part of our long-term strategy to come, or does that not factor in at all? Is it, is it solely like factors like China that we should be focused on in terms of long-term? Um, yeah, that's my question, thanks. I think this is an interesting discussion because we hear this coming up more and more. I think people like uh, Governor Huntsman are kind of advocating this position that a real threat is, is looming in Asia and we need to focus less on the uh, resources we're, we've committed to the Middle East. So Abe, do you want to start then, Ross? Sure. And, and thank you for the kind words on my piece. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think in American foreign policy, in any foreign policy, you've, you've got to walk and chew gum at the same time. We can't, of course, we have to deal with China, but, but that doesn't mean we, we, we don't have to also deal with, with the, the real threat of terrorism, the continued threat of terrorism. And, you know, and one thing I would say is that if you think China is, is eating our lunch today, just imagine how Beijing would have taken advantage of an America weakened by a second, third, fourth serial attacks um, uh, after 9-11, or how Russia would have, um, or how, how little influence we would have had in the Middle East then. So I, I don't, I, I think in some, you know, Ross and I got into this last time we spoke in, in, in New York about the, all, all, the, all the different pots, all, all the different uh, counterfactuals. Counterfactuals. Uh, the way things could have gone if we didn't go into Iraq and what would happen. 
without without going too deeply into that, I think I think it's safe to say that being successful in the war on terror to the extent that we have thus far has helped us um, in in our general geopolitical standing. Um, now, it's very likely that in some ways it's also hurt us, but it's not it's 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 not it's not a zero sum calculation. Um, and I think, uh, of course, we've got to deal with China. And I think, you know, some some true overarching freedom agenda would actually draw the two uh, much closer together. I think I think a sort of China policy that that focused more on human rights and and was was anti autocratic, um, uh, and 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 uh, a bolder freedom agenda in the in the in the Middle East would 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 be sort of you know. I don't know. We, 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 we would speak to the same end result, and and would reduce the credibility gap uh, that we now suffer from, and that we suffered from, frankly, you know, uh, under the Bush administration as well, of of, of preaching uh, liberty and democracy, and then making seeming decisions of necessity with with autocrats and so on. Um, quickly, I I think that the. You know, I, I think what you'll see is sort of counterterrorism wax and wane, um, and, and I, I don't think it will ever disappear from or you know cease being a crucial element in American foreign policy. Just because, I mean, the only way it would cease is if America ceased to be a first-rate power. Because as long as we're a first-rate power and a you know dominant, influential global culture and so on to the extent that there are terrorist movements, whether they're jihadist or something else entirely, they're going to focus on us, and um, we're going to have to focus on them. So I, w I would not expect, you know, I, I think that there will still be predator drone strikes of one sort or another in the year 2028, and maybe they won't be happening, you know, along the Pakistan-Afghan border. But I think the, you know, in a sense, part of our, you know, there, there's been a multiplication, you know, Al-Qaeda has been weakened, but it's also been multiplied at the same time, right? And we are sort of engaged on a smaller scale all around the world, and I would expect, I would expect that to continue. And it, it, I would also expect it to continue for political reasons, because nobody wants to be the president who says, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to really cut the, you know, predator drone budget this year and stop taking out those Al-Qaeda in Somalia guys, and then the next thing you know, the Al-Qaeda in Somalia guys um, or blowing up an airliner. So I would expect that to persist. Um, I think where I'm probably a little more sympathetic to the John Huntsman view of the world um, is is just in the sense that I, I think there are resource constraints on the United States. And I don't think it's a question of saying, well, you know, the threat of China, quote unquote, is more important than the threat of Iran or something. I think the I think Iran is a much more worrisome problem for the United States than China across a host of fronts, um, and I think that will remain so for a while. But I think the question for American policymakers will be, given overall resource constraints at home, what, you know, where do we want our footprint to be? And I think that this has relevance for, you know, well beyond the sort of Iraq-Afghanistan debates that we're all used to having. It has relevance to our presence in Europe, the way our troops are distributed in Asia, and and all across the board. I th and so I think that w one, can simul one can reckon with those resource constraints without sort of choosing decline, which I think is how some voices on the right tend to frame that, that kind of reckoning. Um, and I think if you don't reckon with those resource constraints, you end up in a position where you're sort of surprised by it. Well, you're surprised the way I think a lot of um, DC-based neoconservatives were when the recent budget debates, you know, after being focused on taxes or spending, taxes or spending, at the last minute, um, suddenly it was like, well, we're not doing, we're not raising taxes, but uh, I guess we're going to cut defense spending. And I think a more proactive focus on sort of, well, where are our resources and, you know, what are we thinking about and so on could help avoid some of those sort of nasty surprises in the budget meetings. But that's sort of a, a side point, I guess. As a, a DC-based neoconservative, I don't know that we were surprised. It could have been much worse. But, uh, <laughs> um, in the interest of time, we started a little bit late. We'll, I'll run over a few minutes. But why don't we take two or three final questions and give our panelists a, a chance to respond. Um, Blaze? 
Thank you. Uh, Blaise Mishtal with the Bipartisan Policy Center. We focused some of our discussion about the 9-11 generation on the 9-11 generation here at home, but what about the 9-11 generation abroad? Um, and we, both of you briefly mentioned the Arab Spring and then the prospects that that, have, that has for bringing peace to the region or perhaps conflict and, and, and to the extent that that is a, a continuation or, or, or uh, the harvest of, of, of the freedom agenda. Um, but perhaps you could comment on, on, on how that relates um, both to, to the events of 9-11 and to our policy since then uh, and to the larger geostrategic question of, of how events are likely to shape out in the Middle East. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you said the big one only takes one of those. Oh, oh, if there is one. In the back there. Uh, I was just wondering if you could address um, what's going on in the direction of the Turkish government, whether that reflects Turkish public opinion fundamentally, um, how the U.S. should deal with that, um, whether there may have been an effect of policies over the last 10 years and causing that, or that probably would have happened anyhow. Um, and also sort of how that in interacts with um, what's going on in Iran. And we'll take one final one right on the aisle. Just a real quick question. Can you just recap? You mentioned that there are three categories or, or uh, I guess, generations so. of uh, All right. Okay. Yeah. Dave, why don't you wrap up? Well, I'm that glad that, 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 that speaks to the, f the first of the three questions because that would, I realized I left that out. And my, and my third 9-11 generation was those abroad, actually. That, that's exactly what I was thinking, so I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up and I, and I left it out. Um, yes, what, 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 what of those um, in these countries, those, the, 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 the youth who, who President Bush spoke to after 9-11, who, who he spoke to on the verge of, of, of invading Iraq, the Kurds, the the, the, the Iranians who he, who, who he opened up discussions with via things like Radio Farda, um, those with whom he said he, he will seek, he will stand uh, up with in, in defense of democracy and so on. What of the, what of the I would include in this post 9-11 generation abroad, the uh, Iran's Green Movement, um, who after the June 12th, the fixed June 12th ele uh, election, Protesters were out in the streets of Tehran saying, Obama, are you with us or with, or with the regime, meaning, meaning the regime in Tehran? Um, that is a much more, to my mind, consequential 9-11 generation than those at home who um, have become war weary because the fundamental point of the freedom agenda was to, was, was to give them an alternative to jihad as a as a as a as a vehicle for political redress, um, and we are increasingly failing to do that. And if you believe in in the soundness of the freedom agenda, that will only plant the seeds of future discord, and and will set the timer back on the next attack. So I'm, and, and by the way, it doesn't, they don't need to publicly express um, some sense of being overjoyed at the, that, that the U.S. Has, has deposed this leader or that leader or has helped them or is, or is speaking in, in line with them. You know, after my article came out, some people criticized it because I spoke about, about democracy in Iraq and, and, and the fragile, reversible, um, yet real burgeoning democracy there. And someone wrote about it, criticized my piece, citing all these polls about how Arabs around the region said, in fact, uh, uh, overthrowing Saddam had nothing to do with democratic aspirations and movements around, around, the, around the region. Um, that's fine. We, did, we, we don't need to be acknowledged or thanked, certainly. Um, we just need, we just, it's always, always would be nice. Getting paid was even better. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, but, but, but just objectively having changed the debate is the important thing. And I, and I think it's undeniable that we did that. And I think we risk, look, how did 9-11 happen in the first place? We, after, after we helped to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan, we brought our interest in Afghanistan, American interest in Afghanistan came down to nothing. Our, our, 
our monetary commitment there was somewhere in the sort of five figures a year, I think. Um, we had no diplomatic contact with them. And then suddenly we woke up 10 years later to find this extensive terror network there uh, and, and, and this brilliant attack planned and launched out of there. Uh, abandoning yet another generation to, to the despots and the theocrats of the region. That 9-11 generation, we, we abandon uh, at, at our own risk. So that's, that, that's my thoughts on that. What's that? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm just a little, more, I'm just, yeah, I, I, as you might expect, I'm just, I'm, I, I want to believe in that vision. I'm just a little more skeptical. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there are no, and never have been and never will be, sort of ideal options for American policymakers but dealing with the world in general, but certainly dealing with the Middle East. Um, there are trade-offs no matter what you do, trade-offs between stability and freedom, security, and all the rest. Um, I just look at the progress of the Arab Spring to date, and I don't think it's clear that from the point of view of American interests, or in many cases from the point of view of American values, we are yet reaping the benefits that I think many advocates for the freedom agenda would hope, um, would, would have hoped for. I think, as I said before, that, you know, the trends take a long time to play out and so on. Um, I, I guess I would just say we also have to be prepared for the possibility, and this I think ties to the gentleman's question about Turkey, that um, sort of in a broad sense are, are, are that, you know, that, that President Bush was wrong, you might say, in his second inaugural when he said that our values and interests, um, I forget the exact quote, but that they are, they are one in some sense. Um, and I think that, you know, in the case, in, in cases ranging from Turkey to Egypt to, to other places, at least on a short-term time horizon, um, I think that the the growing democratization um, of, of political culture in those countries poses real threats to Americans' interests and to America's strongest ally in the region. Um, and I think we, you know, you cannot, I think the, the, the counterpoint that, that Abe and many others would make is that, you know, one way or another, you know, the sort of Ataturk settlement in Turkey wasn't gonna last forever. Um, clearly the Mubarak settlement in Egypt wasn't going to last forever and we need to be prepared and sort of proactive about, you know, the, some sort of more democratic order is coming no matter what. And, and I think that that's a very strong point. Um, but again, in terms of sort of, I, I just come back to sort of, you know, you, you judge policies on their fruits and right now I'm very nervous about the fruits of um, sort of democratic transformation in the Middle East. Well, thanks to both uh, Abe and to Ross. I think a, uh, Ross said it best when he said we're going to be debating these issues for, for decades or maybe 75 years from now. I guess I'm hopefully I perhaps, mean, you know, I, perhaps okay with the fact that Ross is a little nervous, what, six, seven months into the Arab Spring. Right, I think we've yeah, got plenty of decades ahead plenty of, of us time, yes. to see how it works out. Um, but please join me in thanking our panelists. And, and thanks to all of you for coming and let us know uh, if you'd be interested in additional information about FBI or being informed about future events. Thanks. <laughs>